now i request dr yk amdekar to deliver his lecture on approach to common common symptom in office practice and i thought it really means we go back to the basics and i think ma many times we have forgotten the basic facts and i think i'll take you through very common symptoms that we see in day to day office practice and see how we could possibly take very quickly the rational approach to all that <clears throat> I think fever is something that we see very commonly. And I think I want you to make a note that if there is no fever, then you better not call it an infection and you don't give an antibiotic. That's a rule. If you gave a child with a cough without fever an antibiotic, that's irrational. Well, we are not talking about a chronic infections which may come without fever, but a short onset of any symptom without fever is no antibiotic. And I think you look back and said how many times you gave an antibiotic. I see in my practice every now and then a child with a cough gets an antibiotic even without fever. I think that's a simple golden rule. Well, when there is no fever, there may be a chronic infection, but that you need to confirm. But if there is a fever, it may mean infection, but not necessarily bacterial. It may be viral or malarial. I have a simple formula to differentiate these three, which works 95% correct. And I don't know any test which acts better. So this is fine. And I've almost never failed in, on this. Look at the onset, the progress on day three, day four, and interfebrile state. And then finally the extent of a disease. And if you look at that, most of the viral infection do start with high onset of fever, <clears throat> whereas typically many bacterial infections start with mild to moderate fever, but peak by day three, day four, whereas the viral infection are getting better by day three, day four. There are exceptions to all these rules. I know viral infection can go on for six days. Majority would behave like that. And I think to that extent, if you look further, then in between, when you give paracetamol and the fever disappears, Viral infection patient looks normal, whereas a bacterial infection patient still looks sick. And finally, a extent of the disease. A viral infection is a disseminated disease. If it's a respiratory tract viral infection, then you have a congested eyes, congested nose, congested throat, and signs in the chest. If it's a bacterial infection of tonsillitis, your nose don't run and your chest is clear. If you have a pneumonia, your throat is normal and your nose is not running. So all bacterial infections are localized. All the viral infections are disseminated. How disseminated? Child of diarrhea and respiratory infection. Disseminated into another system. And ask a simple question, who else in your family is suffering? Sir, every one of us is suffering. Disseminated in the family, in the community, in the child, in the system. Tonsillitis doesn't come like that. Sir, everybody in our family has tonsillitis. No. I think simple rules make a diagnosis reasonably correct. And if it's a viral infection, you will not give an antibiotic. I would imagine, therefore, that antibiotic can be prescribed only after day three or day four. And next time, if you write an antibiotic on the first two days, I think ask yourself, what is your diagnosis? And near 100% you will have no diagnosis. If without a diagnosis you write an antibiotic, you have to be lucky not to get that into trouble. You may get into trouble with partially treated infection. You might use, easily lose a UTI and get him into a chronic recurrent UTI causing renal damage. And today, all over the country, those who are taking dialysis for kidney failure are young adults who have been missed by their pediatricians yesteryear. We need to be alive on that. And it could be your own child too. I have seen many doctors who give left, right, center and antibiotic to their own child. I feel therefore it's not negligence, it's ignorance. And let's remove that ignorance. I have never seen a child dying because I delayed antibiotic by two days. But I have seen children dying because somebody gave antibiotic unnecessarily. And I think once you get this confidence that this works, and I think this is so simple. Malaria is usually an erratic fever. 
Sometimes it's there, sometimes not there, sometimes high, sometimes low. There is no rule of the game. Everywhere there is an exception, but the rule stands. And if you follow the rule first and get very, very proficient in following a rule, then you start picking up those exceptions. But I think this will help every one of us. And I think this is the basis of every kind of fever. How do you manage infection? Of course, I think if it's a viral infection, no antibiotic at all. If it's a bacterial infection, then first localize site of infection, rule out serious infection. For example, when do I diagnose typhoid? Only after four or five days. Shall I give an antibiotic for first four or five days? Answer is big no. Believe me, we have been following this for the last 40 years and never damaged any patient, nor damaged our extent of practice. You need to be confident, and the best way to show confidence is document on your letterhead all that you want to say. And tell a patient, this is my advice, this is put on paper. I think everybody believes. But for that, you need to be sure. Otherwise, you can't write. And Anand already said that if it's a viral infection, your hand will shake if you write an antibiotic, only if you write a diagnosis as a viral infection. Therefore, you tell a patient, don't worry, it's a viral infection. Take amoxicillin, you will be all right. In one breath, you say so many wrong things, but you will never write anything. Make a habit of writing. If you write, you will be honest and you will improve. And I think that is how, in the first three, four days, I only want to exclude serious infection. And there are only few serious infections. Intracranial infection, pneumonia, sepsis, maybe falciparum, malaria, diphtheria. How do I recognize a serious infection in a child? Only by one way, his behavior. A child of intracranial infection is lethargic or irritable. A child of pneumonia is tachypneic and has a respiratory distress and a chest in drawing. And he could also be either lethargic or irritable because of hypoxemia. A child of sepsis again looks lethargic and behavior. What best parameter God has given you and me as a pediatrician to pick up a serious child? Behavior of the child. If a child with 104 fever behaves well, there is no serious illness. If child of 99 fever behaves abnormally, there is a problem. What is behavior? Telling you how the brain is working. In all these conditions, the brain is not working well. In pneumonia, hypoxia. In sepsis, your circulation is affected. In an intracranial infection, of course, the brain is affected. A falciparum will give you trouble if it's complicated. Diphtheria will give you trouble by being toxemic. Everybody will be understand by behavior change. And the moment the parents say, 103 fever, I said, what happens after paracetamol? Oh, doctor, within 20 minutes, he's playful, active, but again he goes up. So I know if he's active in between, he has no serious illness. And I think if you follow this, you will almost never miss a serious infection and fever, and you will not give irrationally an antibiotic. What's the message? Next time you write an antibiotic in the first two days, you have to convince yourself why you are writing. And if you cannot, then you have to convince yourself that there is no serious infection and boldly tell the parents to wait. A fear that a patient will go somewhere else is not right because somebody else's patient will come to you. If everyone behaves the same way, where will they go in this city? So I don't think that's the reason to say, I, therefore I do it. No, you do it because you are not confident. You do it because you are not rational. Otherwise you won't do it. But it's unfortunate that many doctors do it for their own children also. I think it's a pity. And I don't think they should be allowed at all. As a senior pediatrician, I've seen a damage by antibiotics. But I've never seen a damage by missing an infection in the first two, three days, provided there is no serious infection. And how do you understand serious infection? By behavior of the child. That's it. I can almost be sure on the phone that the child is not serious. What more do I want? And I think once you get this confident, and then many times we do CBC. CBC is a useless test. Okay, because it helps you when you don't need help. And it doesn't help you when you need help. That's why I call it a useless test. Why is it useless? When I've got a meningitis or a big pneumonia, whether leukocytes are increased or not, I'm not worried. And if I have nothing in the child and somebody's count is going up, I'm also not worried. And the reasons are many. Look at the total count here. Okay, in an acute bacterial infection, you have a neutrophilic leukocytosis, but in typhoid, you have a leukopenia and a lymphocytosis. 
Who said in an acute bacterial infection there are neutrophilic leukocytosis? Typhoid is an acute bacterial infection with leukopenia and a lymphocytosis. The whole rule is upset. Look at a systemic inflammatory disease, a marked neutrophilic leukocytosis without an infection. You will understand what polymorphs and what total count means. Nothing. And if polys go up, lymphos go down. If lymphos go up, polys go down. Because you all have bluffed it during your residency days, a total CBC must be 100. Otherwise, your boss will catch. That is all that. Okay. Who cares for CBC? But then what's important in CBC? Importance is eosinophils. Eosinophils are suppressed in an acute infection, be it viral, be it bacterial, be it typhoid, all zero. But it is not suppressed in malaria, in chronic infection, and a systemic inflammatory disorder. It's a good way to go by eosinophils. Of course, this means that your counts must be reliable, etc., etc. And m many people who have, do have an automated counter cannot differentiate eosinophil from polys and lymphos. The usual common generation automated counter can differentiate polys, lymphos and others. Others include monocyte, basophils and eosinophil. And a pathologist looks at a peripheral smear and if others are four, he writes zero and four or one and three, his imagination. So you need a reliable person, but it helps. The next one to help is a platelet. Look at platelet. Low platelet in typhoid, maybe low in acute viral infection, maybe low in capillary leak, malaria, and maybe low in ALL, leukemia, but it's high in a systemic inflammatory disease. So you look at eosinophils and platelets, and then you look at the hemoglobin, it's high in capillary leak, it's low in malaria, it's low in ALL. Of course, in our country, many are deficient anemias, so they are also low. The point to make is that polymorphs should not decide an antibiotic. And the patient condition should decide an antibiotic. And I think if you keep that in mind, let 12, 14, 18,000 mean nothing at all. And what a polymorph, they are like constables, they are large in numbers. They are there when nothing is required, because they are loitering. They are there when Rahul Gandhi comes to Mumbai. They are there when Bollywood actor comes. They are there when theft is there, bomb blast is there, traffic accident is there, fire is there. What does that mean? Nothing. But when there is a fire, there are constables in crowd, but when the fire engine comes, you know it's fire. When everybody is running about, you know it's a bomb blast. When everybody is enjoying, you know it's a Bollywood actor. But those polymorphs don't tell me anything. And finally, in front of the police station, there are many constables, there is no problem at all. Polymorphs are exactly like that. They don't tell me anything. But the surrounding situation tells me why they are there. Surrounding situation in a patient is how he is behaving. What does polymorphs do? Nothing. And I think keep that in mind. Many times because polymorphs are one up there, patients are on antibiotic. Totally irrational. Viral infections have 18,000 count with 80% polys. It doesn't mean anything at all. And I think if you keep that in mind, you are rational. What about cough? I think if your child has a cough as a predominant symptom, then he has an airway disease and he has no pneumonia at all and he has almost never a bacterial infection because bronchitis is almost never bacterial. Bronchitis is viral or allergic. So if your child coughs more, don't give an antibiotic. If your child has no fever, don't give an antibiotic. How simple messages, follow it, you will be always rational. And I think therefore, look at this fever. Most of the time, those who cough badly have not much fever except viral infection, but no antibiotic. How does this airway come in? Often, viral infection repeat, and asthma repeats, bacterial infection rarely repeats. So, when the child comes to me with cough, I said, how bad? Sir, very bad cough. Fever? No, sir, no fever. What about past history? Sir, off and on he gets. Oh, I have diagnosed no antibiotic. That's it. What diagnosis take it? If it is accompanied with fever, viral infection. If it is unaccompanied with fever, a febrile cough is allergic hyperreactive airway. For me, only three things can cause cough. Don't go by cystic fibrosis, immortal celia, IgA deficiency. You see once in lifetime, if your life is long. Otherwise, not even that. Okay, so why do we worry about that? 
but we see every day these three fellows only, no? Diagnose one of the three. And if he is not one of the three, or somebody who knows what it is, surely he also won't know. So you know that he also doesn't know. That's fine. And I think this is so. What about alveolar disease, like a pneumonia? Cough is not a major symptom, but the fever is major symptom. So a child starts with fever. What about cough? He yeah, also coughs. And why? what about airway? Sure, cough. What about fever? Yeah, also fever. Two things are different. We have, we have learned in our clinicals, in undergraduate, this chief complaint. Chief complaint is not the complaint that the chief had against you. Chief complaint is what the mother thinks is a prominent symptom. A cough here and a fever here. This fellow is not doing it again and again. If he said pneumonia, sir, every month pneumonia. That means the doctor is wrong. How can be every month pneumonia? He's giving a viral infection and antibiotic every time. And don't go by the chest x-ray. Chest x-ray people are very lucky. They don't have to diagnose anything. They would say query pneumonia. Not even pneumonia, pneumonitis. What is pneumonia? Inflammation of alveoli. What is pneumonitis? Inflammation of that pneumonia. What nonsense. There is no word like, there is no word like pneumonitis. It's, it's, it means I don't know. And therefore, and finally radiologist will say query pneumonia, query right hyler, and below he will write correlate clinically. He's telling a clinician to do what? Correlate clinically. You correlate radiologically should be your answer. So don't believe all that. All asthmas are diagnosed as pneumonias. Read Nelson. It will say asthma is mimicking by, mimic by pneumonia. I wondered what is common? Asthma, asthma has cough. Pneumonia doesn't have much cough. Pneumonia has fever. Asthma doesn't have much fever. And even then Nelson makes a statement, asthma and pneumonia look alike because he wants to say radiologists think it is alike, not the clinician. But time and again we would go by that. And I'm sure you must have seen that a patient who come to you with severe cough again and again will tell you, sir, I don't know, but the chest x-ray is always normal. What does it mean? Air we are seen on a plain chest x-ray. What is the corollary? More the child coughs, never take an x-ray chest. Lesser the child coughs, you may take an x-ray chest. But here we are different. Okay, you're coughing so much, no? Take one x-ray chest. Okay. And then say, I don't know why, but he's coughing so badly, but chest x-ray doesn't show. How will it show? It doesn't show an airway at all. And I think these are simple rules. In fact, I, I see a bunch of x-rays in a child who is coughing badly. I tell them what the x-ray shows without seeing it. Why do we expose those? And in fact, pneumonia needs an x-ray. Yes, exception is there. A foreign body is an exception who coughs badly and has a thing. Yeah, but how many times foreign body? They're all inside bodies only, okay? And I think it's our fault. So higher the cough, lesser the chance of an X-ray chest, lesser the chance of an antibiotic prescription, more the fever, not necessarily an antibiotic, but no fever is no antibiotic. I think even if you take home these four messages, you have improved 90% of your rational practice. Because fever and cough is the commonest thing. And 90% by just two symptoms and four messages. Okay, who wants to be 100% rational? None of us. 90% is good. And just by four messages. And I think you do take that and we will know that it is so simple a medicine. The whole idea is to take medicine as simple as you can understand. Knowing that medicine is complex for those who want to understand something rare. Those who want to understand something common, medicine is simple. Therefore, the consultants and a super specialist make you think that medicine is complicated. For them, it's complicated because for them, any simple disease is a complicated disease. And they're often wrong. For us, all complicated diseases are also simple. We are rarely wrong because complicated disease is rare. And to that extent, you and me will be 95% right and a super specialist will be 50-50 right. Yeah, because he only sees rare diseases. He does not know common diseases. And I think that's where the problem comes up. So that's about the cough. And don't worry, we'll, we'll carry on and we'll show that. What about recurrent fever? 
if recurrent fever is a bacterial infection, then you never, never consider an antibiotic because there is something wrong with the child. Same way recurrent cough. And I think if you have a recurrent cough, upper or lower, just look at all, all that. And I think all that I want to again go by is that, that if it is an upper recurrent cough, which is bacterial, you know, the, and why, how do you know bacterial? We already said how to know bacterial. If it's recurrent, there has to be a cause behind that recurrent. Don't keep on giving antibiotic. First time I diagnose a severe bacterial rhinosinusitis, I treat him. Next time he comes again, I say, no, you must be having some background cause. What is the background cause? Maybe a CF, a cystic fibrosis, an IgA, whatever. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in screening that there is something wrong. And if it's a viral infection, then I think no tests are required, even with recurrent. A normal child gets recurrent viral infection between one and a half, two, to about four and five. It only means it's normal. How do you know it's normal? Because its growth is normal. And how do you know all these Johnnies? Because their growth is affected. What's the corollary? Every child must have a growth chart. We did say that. It's unfortunate that 99% of pediatricians have no growth charts. They are not fit to be pediatricians. Unfortunately, parents don't know they are not fit. How can you treat a growing child without growth monitored? Okay, that's not right. And I think I would plead to say a growth chart will give you a lot of information. It takes half a minute. It impresses the parents. It gives them the right direction. It keeps you cautioned and worried if the growth chart is not getting followed properly. And a simple thing can replace any number of tests. Today, endocrinologists diagnose growth hormone deficiency by a growth chart, not by growth hormone assay. Growth hormone assay is done just to confirm the diagnosis. How powerful is the tool in our hand that takes a minute, your assistant can do it. Even then, you don't want your assistant also to do it. Height of nonsense. I think start using growth charts. And I think you will realize the importance of growth chart. In Bombay, I feel not even 5% have a growth chart. And those who have a growth chart, don't plot it. Those who have a weighing machine, take it because the parents insist on it. But nobody puts a tape and measure it. I think it's, it's criminal. And if it's my child, I won't go to a pediatrician who does not have a growth chart. And every child who enters our clinic for even once in life goes out with a growth chart. It costs 10 rupees. It gives you a lot of feeling good and satisfaction that you have done the best. For just 10 rupees a satisfaction. Does any shop sell you a satisfaction? Even if you have more money? No. Simplest way of being happy. And grateful are the parents. And I've had parents who would say, my neighbor goes to XYZ pediatrician, but he doesn't have a growth chart. Doctor, can I have one from you? Yes. Okay, I don't mind if he goes XYZ, but I want that XYZ to be told by that parent, sir, why don't you have a growth chart? So and so doctor gives growth chart. I hope that makes one doc. So I would plead that everybody must use a growth chart. And I think that's very important. If you have a tachypnea, Okay, it's so simple to diagnose because anyway, you look at the chest retraction and a sound. God is great. If, if he grunts, he has a pneumonia. If he wheezes, he has an asthma. If he has a strider, he has a laryngitis. And if he has no voice, then he is paralyzed. Only four conditions that cause tachypnea. And if none of that, then he has a metabolic acidosis where the chest is clear and the fellow is tachypneic. How easy. You have to just use your ear to diagnose a tachypneic child, where the lesion is. And I think you simple parameters, you can diagnose the condition very, very well. And I think noise, no noise, and nothing makes a diagnosis of a tachypneic child. What about diarrhea? Again, we all know this. Simple viral versus bacterial. If a child has a bacterial diarrhea, you should also have a situation that makes him get a bacterial diarrhea. Viral diarrhea comes in spite of most hygienic condition. For example, a rotavirus stays all around us, on my hand, on my desk, and it cannot die in spite of getting exposed to sun rays, 
or whatever your detergents you use to wash your hands, but not the bacteria. So imagine a breastfed baby getting diarrhea on the phone, you are sure it's not bacterial. How many of us could write an antibiotic, do a stool examination, go by pus cells, do a stool culture, everything criminal. You should never do stool culture in life. Stool culture is a useless test. It has to pick up an unusual organism to be effective. It picks up an E. coli, everybody's stool has an E. coli. I don't know when in 43 years I have asked for a stool culture. And where a culture is required like typhoid, I don't ask. And a urine culture, that is important. Stool culture is a useless test. If I ask you, what instruction did you give to parents to collect a stool sample? You said I never gave, and they gave some sample, and laboratory gave some results, and I used that same antibiotic. How silly. And when it is a blood culture, you wash and clean and all that. And if it's a urine culture, a midstream sample, collect it after cleaning. And a stool, don't collect any way, it's all right. You will understand what's the method of a stool culture and therefore it's a useless says never do it in life. I'm sure we all know a difference between bacterial and viral. Even then I see a full well breastfed baby growing well, getting an antibiotic based on a stool culture showing E. coli and resistant to all. So he gets some funny antibiotic. Uh, assess nutrition, this is very important. And we did talk earlier that growth nutrition is a must for every child. And I think it's important that you have an anthropometric measurement. Again, therefore, you must know weight for height. And unless you have a chart, you will not know that. I think I rarely see a chart. And every time my assistant, when she sees a file of some other pediatrician, I say, first, plot it on our chart. And the chart talks so much. And it's convincing. Again, a plea that you must use the chart. The growth problems are solved by a chart again. There are many children who are not gaining weight, but they are not losing height. What is growth? Height is a parameter of growth, not the weight. And what is health? Health is activity and happiness, and an energy and a stamina. And what is weight? Weight should not be lost, that's all. Even if it's not gained, it's all right. So the whole year he has not gained, okay. But how is he? Every mother who brings me a thin child who is not gaining weight, sir, whole last year has not gained any weight. And I ask her one question, how active is he? Sir, he is so active I get tired. Every mother has answered this. And my diagnosis is made. Madam, you are weak, not your son. Mother gets tired, child does not. And mother feels that child is weak. <laughs> how silly. I think the problem is solved. Therefore, growth is measured by height, not by weight. Why is this measured by height? Because once you achieve height, you cannot lose it. Once you achieve it, you can jolly well lose it. So child between one and two years is often mixing with the community, getting recurrent viral infection, gains half a kilo, loses half a kilo. Goes on at the end of two years, sir, same as one year. What has happened about height? No, sir, he was 75, now he's 87. Oh, he has gained good height. What about activity? Sir, very active. What about happiness? He is happy not eating. Then keep him happy not eating, no? Why you are making him unhappy eating? Okay, easy. Okay, and I'm sure these are common problems. Explain them everything. Ask the mother, do you want your child to be happy or you are to be happy? No, sir, of course my child. If he is happy starving, please. Okay, you are looking after your own happiness at the cost of your child's unhappiness. And I think that is the way to convince that is height is a measure of growth, therefore activity a measure of health. And I think therefore it's so easy. But look at a child who is failing to thrive. His height is also going down. He is not active. He is not happy. Ask the mother, so last three months he is irritable, he is cranky. He was never like that. What has happened to his length last three months? Sir, he has not been taken. That's the answer. Again, therefore take the length in an infancy every month. Thereafter, every three months, maybe thereafter, every six months. We follow a chart right up to 18 years, and I think it's a must. It will tell you varieties of things. It will pick up an acute illness, because weight is lost, height is not lost. It will pick up a chronic illness, weight and height both are lost. It will tell you the behavior of the child. It will differentiate normal thin child from an abnormal fat child. 
so good a growth chart again and therefore don't miss on that and then the short stature everything is simple if you follow the rules if somebody comes to you as a short stature first you need to know whether he has been short ever since birth or he is becoming short now how will you know that without a growth chart again I can diagnose the growth hormone deficiency hypothesis. What are cause of short stature? Simple, chronic infection, chronic organ dysfunctions. Weight and height both are going down after being normal for some time. What about hypothyroid? Okay, the height is dragging, weight may not be. What about hypopit? Both height and weight are going in the same way, but at a lower velocity. What about constitutional? Oh, gaining parallel to the growth chart easy to diagnose all short stature just by growth chart and the velocity you can imagine how many illnesses you must be missing if you did not have a growth chart and i think every child who comes at short or whatever you know clearly by your growth chart what about obesity a simple rule to follow is tall and obese is only constitutional or genetic and short and obese is endocrine Again, take a height. Obese fellow, short, syndromic, endocrinal, whatever. Tall and obese. Constitutional, family history, or then the lack of exercise, more eating, etc. No investigation. How easy. Endocrinologist, if he does not become a clinical endocrinologist, will need a lot of investigation. You and me won't. And therefore, look at the short stature. Easy, sick short stature or happy short stature. Sick short stature, no chronic, chronic infection, chronic organ dysfunction. Happy short stature, no chronic infection, no chronic organ dysfunction, no test required. Happy short stature, but mentally dull, hypothyroid. Happy short stature, symmetrical, small, hypopit. What remains is constitutional or genetic. Growth chart will show that. Diagnosis is over by clinician in half a minute. Same is obesity. Tall and obese, inquire what he's eating. He's sitting in front of TV, computer all the time, and he's munching all the time, and he has a genetic stature. Don't investigate. Correct all those habits. Short and obese, investigate. I think these are golden rules to follow. You will never miss a diagnosis. Development. We already said about development, and I want to again impress that child has to grow and child has to develop. We must know the development correctly, and I've already mentioned about all these things earlier uh, during our discussion, and I've already said that what you must do at one year, what you must do at 18 months, and I think how you pick up a global delay, autism, or a hearing defect, and therefore we'll go further on that. Look at the sexual development also. Not only at the adolescence, of course, yes, but even examine genitals during the first visit, and we again said that in our discussion. You might have ambiguous genitalia, you may have hyposperias, you may have undescended testes, all that. I think when you have a, some palpable mass somewhere in the inguinal region or a scrotum, you have a Y chromosome. And if he has an ambiguous genitalia, then he has a male pseudo-hermaphroditism. How simple. Okay. And therefore, main, many diagnostic areas are simple. If you have a bilateral cryptarchidism at birth in a normal, full-term child, he needs to be investigated. If you have a female child with some inguinal hernia and a mass there, you need to investigate. If you have a, a, a hypospadias, okay, and an extreme penoscrotal hypospadias, you need to investigate them. They are all sexual differentiating point, and I'm sure Sudhakar Jado will know as a surgeon, ambiguous genitalia, he would be called on immediately, but what is ambiguous genitalia? Simple. A clinician must answer three questions. What is phenotypic sex? What is gonadal sex? And what is chromosomal sex? Diagnosis is clear. You have a male pseudohermaphrodite, you have a female pseudohermaphrodite, you have a true hermaphrodite, you have a mixed gonadal dysgenesis. Four conditions diagnose on these three phenotypic sex, gonadal sex, chromosomal sex. Well, we are not discuss about an acute onset of a CAH uh, in a female who comes with 
of marked diarrhea and vomiting and an ambiguous genitalia. We all recognize that very easily because he comes as a sick child. Others come only for an ambiguous genitalia. And I think the point I want to make is that even an ambiguous genitalia is a complicated problem for many of us. I'm sure many of us must have left out that endocrine part in an exam, hoping they will not ask such funny question because we don't understand those terms and hormones. Make it easy now. You could see how hypothyroid can be diagnosed, hypopit can be diagnosed correctly. Not the face. Face is exposed to environment. Not the, not the conjunctiva. It's exposed to varieties of insults. Not the tongue. You might have a bald tongue. You might have vitamin deficiency. But the palm. And a palmist we should know anemia as well. And I think, look at the palm. When you have an anemia, it's so simple. You have liver and spleen in an anemia, so that's not a deficiency anemia, nor an aplastic anemia. It's a hemolytic anemia. Or it's an infiltration in the bone marrow. Leukemia, osteopetrosis, myelofibrosis. So simple. Anemia with liver and spleen. Okay, bone marrow infiltration or hemolysis. If there is a hemolytic phase, jaundice, etc., hemolysis. Otherwise, if there is a pancytopenia, there is a bone marrow. How simple. Deficiency anemia, generally not with liver and spleen, exceptions apart. Coilonachia, platinachia, and pigments of the knuckles. And then you do an MCV. MCV is high, you have a B12 folate deficiency. So, so simple. I think for a hematologist, it's complicated because he has rare bone marrow uh, infiltrative disorders. For us, they don't exist. For us, anemias are of four types. Hemorrhagic, where the bleeding is known. A large hematemesis and anemic. You don't have to say, but what's the cause? So hemorrhagic, hemolytic, deficiency, bone marrow. Bone marrow of two types, aplasia or infiltration. Imagine a factory. Bone marrow is a factory. When is the factory in trouble? when it is closed, aplasia, or when there are bad elements infiltrating, factory is not working. So infiltration and aplasia. Infiltration, liver and spleen. Aplasia, no liver and spleen. Diagnosis is clinical. Acute anemia, chronic anemia. Acute hemolytic anemia. Acute aplastic anemia. Deficiency is never acute. Hemorrhage is maybe acute or chronic. Chronic comes as deficiency. So again, we don't need hematologists. We can diagnose clinically. And what about the bleeding disorders? Again, they are simple. We know the difference between coagulation disorders and a platelet disorders. But just a word that now that you have an automated counter, how does an automated counter know it's a platelet? It does not understand platelet. He's not MD pediatrics. So the counter only knows the size. A smallest size counter says platelet. A little bigger size, it calls RBC, and another bigger size, it calls WBC. Now, when there is a microcytic anemia, like an iron deficiency, RBC becomes small, so my counter calls it platelet. And that's how you get misled. If you have an ITP in a microcytic hypochromic iron deficient anemia, the thrombocyte count may not be low, and it still has an ITP. How will you sort out this problem? So see the number of platelets in high power field and multiply it by 10,000 and that's the real count. Simple way of going. So tell the pathologist, tell me also number of platelets seen on a high power field. If he sees five platelets on an average per high power field, then your platelet count is 50,000. But no sir, the counter says four lakh. Counter is counting some other small cells. And I think these are the issues that we may get bogged down sometime. And I think we take care of these because these are common mistakes. And when you see a child with bleeding, you don't need a hi-fi test. You need only three tests, which are available for all of us. Platelet, PT, and PTT. And look at all this. It gives me a diagnosis of factor 13, ITP, DIC, vitamin K, coagulation factor, liver failure. All condition can be diagnosed by just three simple tests which are available in every laboratory. Then what coagulation factor defect that a hematologist can decide. And therefore, again, when it's a bleeder, it's not difficult for you and me with a simple laboratory test to define all that. You can see that this fellow is bleeding because of 13 deficiency and he has got all three normal. 
and every time you can differentiate. I'm sure you see this in every textbook, every chart, but we don't take care of it. I think if we just learn this again and again and again, then I know when a bleeder comes, I know clinically what it is, and I know by these three tests where I am. And it is as simple as that. So try to kind of localize and focus your study from a point of view that that is most useful for routine clinical practice. Who wants to know how to differentiate a hemophilia from parahemophilia and what do you add where? Oh, that's somebody else's problem. But I must know that it's a coagulation defect. What about the liver? Many times when you say it's a liver disease, you are not talking correctly. Liver is a multiple different characters anatomically. Liver consists of four things for a clinician. Liver has a hepatocyte, liver has a biliary tract, liver has a venous system, and liver has a reticular endothelial system. You must diagnose which part of the liver is involved, and it's not difficult at all. If it's the hepatocyte, then you have a, not only jaundice, but also low albumin and maybe even low prothrombin complex, because hepatocyte functions which are synthetic are obstructed. What about biliary fellow? Oh, he's easy. He has a clay colored stool and high, but he's normal. If a hepatocyte is abnormal, he's sick. If biliary tract is abnormal, he's happy. He may be deeply jaundiced, but he's happy. Then he becomes hepatobiliary, finally. Both get involved. And what about the reticular endothelial cell? Okay. He has a liver enlargement, but he has no portal hypertension and is no liver cell dysfunction. He has just a large liver. That's how a storage liver comes in. That in a reticular or a miliary TB comes in. So a large liver without liver cell dysfunction and portal hypertension is my RE cell disease. And a venous obstruction, you know. I think while coming just now, Mahesh was talking about a butchery. A large liver with an ascites, but a normal liver function. But a constrictive pericarditis will look similar. And what's the message? When you have a large liver, look at a neck veins also. Every cirrhosis may be a constrictive pericarditis. Because of a large liver and an ascites, you will miss veins. Make a habit of looking at the veins when you have a large liver, and you will diagnose a constrictive pericarditis, which looks like a butt share, which looks like a cirrhosis of liver with ascites, but easy to differentiate if you stick out the neck of the patient. And I think that's where it is. So let's go beyond undergraduate days and say, it's not a liver disease, it's a hepatocyte disease, it's a biliary tract disease, it's a RE cell disease. I think makes diagnosis easy, and I think that's the message as far as the liver is concerned. What about neurology? I think neurology is mathematics, and it's very, very simple again. Bacterial meningitis and TB meningitis are often confused. What is bacterial meningitis? Is meningitis with least involvement of encephalon. Fellow is conscious till you miss the diagnosis. <coughs> what is TBM? He has a meningoencephalitis. So what is TBM? A global encephalopathy with a focal lesion. What is bacterial meningitis? No focality generally and no encephalopathy generally. What is viral encephalitis? Generally no focality, but only an encephalopathy. Simple. Mostly it will work. At least the baseline thinking should be that. And there should be no confusion. What about the lower motor neuron? Many times you will see a, a lower motor neuron problem, and then we are always fighting whether it's an anti nerve or a muscle. <coughs> Again, it's simple for a clinician. anti cell disease, loses power, tone, and reflexes symmetrically. Look at a polio. No power, hypotonic, absent reflexes. All three gone. What about a nerve disease? Tone is maintained for a long time. Reflexes are gone early, and of course, loss of power. And look at a muscle disease. Reflexes are preserved till late. So simple. All three gone simultaneously, a anterior cell disease. Call it an SMA. Call it a poliomyelitis, whatever. And if the tone is near normal, but a power and reflex are lost, it's a neuropathy. And if a reflexes are retained, but a tone and power is gone, it's a myopathy. Then you further go proximal distal. Many neuropathies are distal or progressive. 
Many myopathies are proximal or localized, like limb girdle or facial scapular humeral, all that. But the basic difference between the three sides of a low motor neuron lesion is not difficult. For a neurologist, it's difficult because he knows combination diseases. We don't have combination. We have one disease for one patient. And I think mostly we are right. So again, making it simplified that you should have no problem. Nephrology is something that you should be worried about. And I think the, I've already said that how my UTI needs a confirmation before antibiotic because we know how to progress on investigation of UTI. But what is very important is I think a hematuria and also a proteinuria. Many times you will see few RBCs in urine and of course common cause may be febrile hematuria or you might find albumin 1 plus which could be a febrile or a postural or an exercise induced and what not. It is true that that's a common cause. But have you checked it again when fever disappears that the hematuria has disappeared? Probably no. The point I want to make is that every hematuria or, or a proteinuria of whatever kind, sir, only one plus. What is one plus? One plus is at one time examined without knowing a specific gravity of urine and without knowing whether it's acid or alkaline urine. A one plus may be four plus really, or a four plus may be one plus really, depending on the specific gravity and acid base nature of the urine. We don't take into consideration that. And I think where we pediatrician miss a kidney disease is because we ignore a one plus mild proteinuria or few RBCs. There is no reason why RBC should be in the urine. There is no reason why albumin should be in the urine. But occasional sample may show normally. Then what do you do? Always look at two things, a urine protein creatinine ratio. And you know that a spot sample of urine protein creatinine ratio ideally should be as low as 0.2 or 0.5. If it is more than one, it's abnormal. And if it's more than two, then it's a nephrotic syndrome. I see a child who doesn't have much of edema, who has urine one plus albumin, and his urine protein creatinine ratio may be six or seven, and he has got a massive proteinuria. He's a nephrotic syndrome. Not every time a child comes with all book picture, but it's important that urine protein creatinine ratio is a very good guide. It tells you where the kidney is not normal and is losing albumin. And that has to be answered why. Why is subsequent? But first, picking up is important. And same is the story of serum creatinine. It's the GFR and not the serum creatinine that is important. Can you calculate GFR? Yes. A simple formula which almost works always, 0.55 into height in centimeters divided by serum creatinine is a GFR in ml per minute. And a normal GFR is 80 per mil per minute. When does the serum creatinine go up? Only when a GFR comes down to 30 ml per minute from 80. And when you pick that up, you have already a renal failure. You go straight to a dialysis. That's the reason why today many adults are on dialysis young age, because their nephrons were X number, which could serve a purpose when you were small. As you got bigger and you got through adolescence and maybe a woman got pregnant, her requirements of nephrons, glomeruli, were much bigger to maintain normal kidney function and they were not there, they were dysplastic, they were damaged, but you didn't know. And now, suddenly, you find the serum creatinine high. So, always calculate an eGFR, e small stands for expected GFR, not an actual GFR, but always works fairly well with this kind of... And what else works? Again, go back to my growth chart. A child who is faulting height, is a renal failure. But you never took the height, so you never knew that. And you waited till creatinine became high, and I think that's where you faulted, and you diagnosed a short child with an abnormal creatinine when he already should be on a dialysis. 
I think the fault was ours. Kidney disease is a very important element for pediatricians. We cannot take lightly hematuria. We cannot take lightly proteinuria. We must diagnose by urine protein creatinine ratio and by expected GFR calculated by a simple formula. If you make that habit, you would be surprised to see that there exists a sizable population of children who, are, who have a dysplastic kidneys, who have a damaged kidneys, and they go through childhood happily, but they're not growing well, but we have not monitored growth. They're not active, oh, he's always lazy, and I think he comes as an adult, and they have forgotten whom to blame, which pediatrician to blame. I think we, we must take this very, very easily. And the last thing to make, which I've already said in discussion, first visit, I think, remember to check all that. Time and again, one has missed many of these things. Some of them may not be dangerous to life, but that could be told to the parents, prevented from getting worse, treated properly at the right time, a CDH can be much easily treated if diagnosed early rather than diagnosed late. And I think many of these. To that extent, I would just end up by saying that all that I took you through was a very common scenarios of fever, cough, diarrhea. I emphasize every time a growth chart. I emphasize on development. I emphasize on nutrition. I came on a liver disease to tell you liver disease is undergraduate. Hepatocyte, biliary, RE cell, and a venous disease is a postgraduate. I told you about the kidney, how important it is not to miss. I told you how anemia is simple to diagnose. And so also bleeding disorder by simple platelet PT and PTT. And I finally told you how not to miss on first visit. What did we do? We used our brain, we used our eyes and ears and our hands. And what the most important, what we used, was our commitment to find something. If you had these, and we have all that, we have plenty of it, but we have no time. My teacher always said that the most busy person has enough time. I said, sir, what does that mean? He said he's so busy that he has to do everything time, and therefore he's never short of time. So he always said, if you say I have no time, he said you have no work and you are lazy. Busy people have time and we are all busy people. So we have time. And time is money. You have enough money, which means you have enough time. It's only commitment. Thank you very much.